Good afternoon. As chairman of the Associated Student Speakers Program, I'd like to welcome you to our first program of the winter quarter. We're very pleased to have with us today Dr. B.F. Skinner, famous psychologist, author of Walden II, and many other books, which I can't remember now. <laughs> Sorry. Here with us today. We're very uh, lucky to get him. He was supposed to be speaking tonight to the extension program. And it took me about an hour and a half to convince him over the phone to come. And we made a deal. Uh, he's only going to answer questions from the audience. And uh, we set up roving mics, which uh, I really can't see because I didn't expect this many people here. Uh, do we have roving mics? Where are they? Oh, fine. Okay. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll bring a mic to you. And Dr. Skinner will attempt to answer your question. So right now, we'll start first question with uh, please raise your hand. There's one hand over there, another hand over there. Is there a mic on that side? Can't see because of the light. Somebody get a mic to somebody. Oh, okay, we got a question over there. Go ahead. Uh, Dr. Skinner, isn't behavioralism basically running rats? Isn't what? Is behavioralism basically isn't running what? rats? It, it used to be, but that was about 50 years ago. No, uh, I haven't uh, worked with a rat for uh, 35 years. I've worked with human subjects extensively and so have a great many other people. It, the whole point of behaviorism, not behavioralism, behavioralism is a branch of political science that I have nothing to do with. Behaviorism is simply an effort to explain behavior in terms of the genetic and environmental histories of an organism, including the human organism, rather than in terms of mental states, feelings, attitudes, and other things attributed to an inner man. Uh, Dr. Skinner? Yes. Unless I'm... Unless I'm mistaken, the concepts of praise and blame are considered outmoded or at least fallacious according to behaviorism. Uh, in the ideal culture then, uh, the designed culture, how would you in reinforce uh, the good behaviors of a, of a child except through the implied praise or blame of a reinforcement or a negative reinforcer? I don't think praise and blame are, are, are um, outmoded. We're going to go on reacting to those around us and uh, if what someone does is uh, aversive to us we're going to blame him or criticize him or ridicule him or somehow or other uh, hope to uh, get him to stop doing that and if uh, someone does something that uh, is reinforcing to us we're going to reinforce him with approval and uh, what uh, lies back of that but praise and uh, and uh, blame are themselves not reinforcers. They're verbal devices which are derived from the real reinforcers. And if, uh, someone who praises you is a person who's likely to do other nice things to you. And someone who blames you is a person who'd like to hit you or, or attack you or do something else that is injurious. So that uh, in a behavioral analysis, there is no essence of, of approval, no essence of disapproval. They're just uh, verbal devices, what we call conditioned reinforcers, that derive from the things that are reinforcing, uh, which are the result of the genetic endowment of the individual. The human species is, because of its evolution, reinforced by certain things, by foodstuffs when hungry, by sexual contact, by, uh, unfortunately, by evidences that you can work damage on others, and so on. These have all had survival value. That's why they are part of our genetic endowment. And all, uh, all verbal reinforcers, all social reinforcers, come from those basic biological reinforcers eventually. Dr. Skinner, with the social turmoil now in the United States particularly, do you think that this is partially due to the fact that we no longer look toward our parents as authority images, but toward our peers and sister brother as authority. Okay, no longer look for what? I'm getting some sort of a... No longer look here. toward our parents as the parents. ultimate no authority. No longer look towards our parents as the ultimate authority. Oh, well, I, th I think we're in the throes of a very worthwhile revolution against authoritarian control, if you mean by that punitive control, uh, the kinds of 
of governmental punishments which are meted out by the police and the military, the kinds of religious punishments which are described in the picture of hell and so on, the, uh, the um, stronger pun social and ethical punishments of disapproval and all of that. I think we're trying to get away from that, and I'm all for it. I'm all for minimizing any kind of uh, punitive control, but I don't believe that for a moment that that means that we're not being controlled, and if by an authority you simply mean someone who is in a position to control other people, then we have to accept that there will always be such, but it, I don't think it's going to be any one person at the top of some totalitarian structure. Teachers control students, students control teachers, parents control children, children control parents. It's going on all the time and uh, someone may emerge in a position that you say, yes, he's an authority, but I think that's uh, irrelevant. We are all being controlled all the time and the question is whether or not we're being controlled well so that uh, our own, we develop to the very best of our genetic endowment. Uh, Dr. Skinner, if I understand correctly what you say in uh, Freedom and Dignity, you claim that the individual has no role in his uh, uh, directions, that he responds to control by the environment, uh, but yet this control is exerted in more and more subtle ways as mankind evolves in complexity. Now, isn't the individual exactly that that extra complexity that's needed to process these subtle controls. Well, the individual, as far as I can see, is an individual member of a species. It's an organism, and uh, it has a genetic history, and it has an environmental history. What it does is determined by that history. When someone says, yes, but I know I exist and that I can determine what I'm going to do next, what is he talking about? Well, he's talking about his own body as that body has been altered by the environments to which he's been exposed. I, I don't throw out concepts like self or even concepts like self-control. But when you control yourself, you are working in ways which have been uh, taught to you by your environment. You might control yourself with respect to the natural environment if you, for example, you eat some delicious food and the next day you have a rash and do this often enough, you stop eating that food. You have to control yourself, though it's very delicious. How do you keep yourself from, from eating a delicious food if, if it is going to give you a rash the next day? Now, the same thing is true of, of, of social situations. How do you avoid being aggressive and annoying to people if in the long run you know that's going to keep them from seeing you again and, 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 and doing you favors and that sort of thing? These, these selves are just different parts of the behavioral repertoires of this organism. There's an organism there, of course, and it is an individual uh, in a very, a very definite sense that it's a member of a species, but that individual is the product of, of a past history, and the individual himself does not start anything. That's the whole issue of autonomous man. Does anything really start inside a person which is not caused by something which precedes. I don't think that's the case. I don't want to get on to my lecture tonight because I don't want to cheat the people who have brought me here and charge four dollars to hear me, but I think we are going through a second revolution with respect to a creative mind. The first revolution was the Darwinian one. Uh, at, up to the time of Darwin, all of the uh, immensely diverse forms on the surface of the earth had been attributed to a creative mind, to a creator. Now, good many people still believe that, of course, but scientists in general have given up creative mind with a capital M. Now, I feel we've got to give up the notion of a creative mind with a small m, that there is nothing which starts, nothing which originates within the individual but we're finding it much more difficult to give that up than, we, and, uh, than to give up uh, mind with the capital M. We have too much involved in this. We are too, uh, too fond of our own supposed capacities to initiate action. In the movie Clockwork Orange, there's a person that commits murder and he's reconditioned using behaviorist techniques where he becomes nauseated at any kind of violence. In, in less than a year, he's sent back out into society. Do you see this type of therapy 
being a possibility for prison reform? Well, I think it's a great possibility for prison reform. There's no doubt about that. You just have to look at prisons to see that. There's a book just been published called A New Learning Environment, which reports on an experiment done at the National Training School for Boys in Washington, D.C., which was what used to be called a reformatory. There you have a bunch of teenage armed robbers, rapists, and murderers living together for a year or so. Uh, they were then going to be released to the world at large. What can you do with them? Well, the usual thing is you keep them around under, under aversive pressure, threats, and so on. You try to force them to learn a little something which they don't do and don't do well, and then you let them go. Well, now, in this experiment, the whole, the whole culture of that institution was changed. A, a boy did not need to do anything. He could sleep on a pad in a dormitory. He could eat nutritious but not very palatable food. He could sit around all day. He could go on relief, as they put it. But he could, if he, if he did something, uh, greatly improve his lot. He could get better food. He could have access to pool tables and other play equipment. He could watch television. He could hire a, rent a private room and his own television set. He could buy time off. I visited that project, and there was a, a murderer out on the town. He'd bought a day off. Well, you, you, buy, <laughs> you, you, uh, you, you, you buy all of these things with points which you earn, and you earn them mostly by learning something. There were programmed instruction, teaching machines, and other learning materials with tests and so on, and, and right answers meant points. As a result, these kids began to learn something. Most of them had been dismissed by school systems as uh, unteachable. Uh, and, and that's usually the, the, the case. These people had, these came from very poor family structures. They'd never been able to get jobs and so on. They began to learn something and qualify themselves to, to live decently in the world at large. And the morale of the place changed. They were, they were reasonably happy while they were there. I think this is going to happen. I was very happy to see that Justice Berger even uh, began to, has begun to suggest that prisoners um, might buy time off. They might shorten their sentences by being productive while they're there. For example, by learning things. Many prisoners are illiterate, and if they, if you could, if you say, look, you you learn to read at the fifth grade level, and you'll have a year off your sentence. Well, that makes a big difference, and it gives them something to do all day long, except besides sitting there and watching television. I think a great deal can be done to change the culture in a prison so that the individual begins to develop himself and emerges a, a much more effective person. I have a question. Uh, is the impression I get is that you're, you want to control the individual to uh, maintain the culture after man has died, uh, us as individuals. How do you relate this to the repressed groups in America? How do you arrange? How do you relate that to the repressed groups in America? The, 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 what kind uh, of? How do you relate this to the, you know, the repressed groups in America? Well, uh, it's very hard to relate it, and and bear in mind that I I don't have a few principles here with which I can solve any problem you bring up. Um, this is if I was supposing I were here as an engineer. Uh, and knew something about the stresses and strains in metals, and you'd say, I want to build a bridge, how shall I do it? Well, I couldn't tell you without looking into the situation in great detail, and to take any one of these groups and to analyze what the situation is and what can be done would, would take a great deal of time, and I can't give you a snap answer to that. But I do believe that our culture is at the moment failing to get those who live in it to be interested in its own future. I was talking uh, along these lines uh, about a month ago with the group, and there was, a, there was a, a young black boy there, and he said, I don't give a damn whether this culture survives. And I said, that's exactly what I mean. It does not mean anything wrong with you, but it means something very wrong with the culture, because the culture has now lost one man. As one man will be interested in it. Cultures, good cultures, are able to induce their members to work, to strengthen themselves, to work for their survival. You can do it in jingoistic ways. Rome convinced everybody that it was sweet and decorous to die for Rome. It was great for Rome, but it was pretty bad for those who died. Well, how can you bring about uh, a situation in which everyone in a culture really cares about the future of that culture? And I think, I don't know what's happening in China, but there are a few bits of information can seep out now and then. We'll get the whole story when Nixon comes back. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it does seem to be the case that, 
that the young Chinese, to a man and a woman and a girl, are working hard for the greater future of China. Now compare that with what's going on in this country, and, and you see a real threat, it seems to me. I, I, I believe that there are reasons for working for the good of the culture, but they are not really personal reasons. And unfortunately, when someone says to me, why should I care? whether the world 100 years from now is mainly Chinese or mainly uh, uh, Caucasian or mainly black, or whether it's our culture or some other culture, I think the only honest answer is there's no good reason. But if your culture hasn't convinced you there is, so much the worse for the culture. Nobody's going to survive 100 years, none of you, um, but your culture may, and it will, if it is successful in inducing you to work for its strength. It's the evolution of the culture which is the essential issue here. Good, good cultures, strong cultures, manage to mobilize the efforts of the people who live in them. And I think we're failing pretty desperately in that respect now. Dr. Skinner, um, do you think that psychology can be made a pure science rather than a social science? I, I think that psychology can be made a pure science instead of a social science. Oh, well, I don't know whether what a, a pure science or social science. I think there is a science of behavior now which is reasonably rigorous, it, uh, reproducible results. I think what we are doing in an operant laboratory is constructing a very precise environment, necessarily simplified, and watching the effect of it on behavior. Now, it's not, not as simple as many people think. If you go into an operant laboratory these days and let someone look let, let get someone to let you look into the space in which an organism is behaving. You can sit there and watch that for a long time without figuring out what's going on. And that's why it's so hard to figure out what's going on in the world at large, which is even more complicated. But the, the experiments are getting very complex, and uh, I, I wouldn't want to quibble about what a science is, uh, but I am concerned with order, rigor, at the level of the individual organism, not I don't want actuarial or order. I don't want uh, statistical uniformities. I want a uniformity in the behavior of the individual, and that is the thing that the operant uh, movement has, I think, managed to to achieve. I think we we are dealing always with individual organisms and showing a great deal of order in their behavior. Now it's a beginning science. And when someone says, oh, but learning theory can't tell you this, can't tell you that, they usually imply it will never be able to do so. But that's, that's a dangerous kind of, of prediction because I, I'm very pleased with the speed with which this kind of thing has advanced over the past 25 or 30 years. Do Dr. Skinner, yes. uh, you suggested in your book that uh, the reconstruction or of the educational system at large seemed to be a necessary requirement for the changing of a culture. You said it intimated also that it w might be nearly impossible. Now, my question is, uh, in 57, you were building the teaching machines. As a matter of fact, I stepped into your lab. Yep. And uh, what has since become of the, po uh, the power of the teaching machine, and why is it not uh, yet in the public educational system? Yeah, that, that, um, I, I am, um, as I say, it's nearly impossible to change the educational establishment. It's not difficult to change educational methods. It's very hard to get them adopted. Educational establishment has vested interests. Problems are serious enough right now not to bother bringing in innovations and so on. And it has been very difficult. Where these principles have been applied is in industry, and for a very good reason. In industry, you can change teaching practices like that without getting a change in the law or a change in the school board or a change in what parents think about what's going on in the school and so on. Moreover, in an industry, there is someone whose head will roll if he overlooks a better way of teaching. There's no one in any educational institution I've ever known about whose, whose future depends to the slightest extent on whether or not he improves teaching. I, I, I will add that uh, uh, the, the computer people have, to my mind, greatly uh, disturbed the development of teaching machines because computers are simply out of the question economically and they have allowed people to do things which shouldn't have been done. With a computer you can simulate a teacher. 
but that's what we don't want to do. Dr. Skinner, uh, your behaviorism methods have been used a lot when dealing with autistic children, yeah. mentally retarded children, schizophrenic adults, in token economies and other such places. I was wondering if you believe that these autistic children and schizophrenic people are actually being helped, actually being uh, treated in such a way that they are going to live more richer and more fulfilling lives, or are they just being treated as animals and being shown and trained into how to act? Well, I'd, uh, you have to make a distinction between the management of people like that and, the, and therapy. I think the main achievement to date has been in the field of management. I think you can construct an environment in which psychotics and retardates can lead reasonably decent lives, and I'll define that if you insist. Uh, but it's not a normal environment, and I think many of these people can never adjust to a normal environment. It's what a former student of mine, Ogden Lindsley, calls a prosthetic environment. Uh, eyeglasses are prosthetic devices which enable you to see better. Hearing aids enable you to hear better. I need one here today, apparently. Um, these and uh, artificial limbs are prosthetic devices, but the world in which you live can be prosthetic. That is, it can be a world to which a defective organism can adjust more easily. And that's what you design, that's what you do when you redesign the ward of a state hospital or a home for retardates and so on. Many of these people will never get better in the sense they'll be able to get away in, in get into a normal environment. It's particularly true of autistic children. I think it's a very discouraging field. You can, you can make great changes in an autistic child. You can bring him back into contact with the world and society, but uh, it's, a, it's a very puzzling disorder, and, uh, and I, I would not want to hold out very much hope that such a child would ever become uh, completely effective in the world at large. Uh, the, it's, but on the other hand, there are very uh, good examples where genuine therapy has occurred. In the state of Michigan, they did an experiment using two wards of state hospitals which were matched statistically and all of that and one of them they allowed to go on as it is and the other one they in the other one they introduced a token economy now it cost them some money they had to pay a psychologist part time and they had to buy some uh, some re reinforcers and so on uh, but at the end of a year, one-third of the people in that experimental ward had, had been dismissed from the hospital. No one had been dismissed from the other ward. A year later, they, those were, all those dismissed people were still out and getting along well. And in that single year, they recovered everything it cost them, of course, not to mention the, the savings in, in, in human decency. Uh, Dr. Skinner, uh, as I understood it in your book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, uh, uh, such uh, things as uh, government, church, uh, education, parents, they're the ones who are haphazardly uh, uh, controlling us, uh, instilling behavior pattern. Yeah. And uh, you suggested that this be replaced by a controller. And uh, you spent a chapter on value judgment, and I'm not quite sure who is to uh, instill these value judgments, whose value judgments and uh, ethical moral codes are we supposed to accept? Yeah, what do you... Did you finish? Yes, I did. Well, um, I don't want to replace those who are now in positions of control with a controller. I want those who are now controlling to control better. I think parents do a very bad job in general handling the children in the home. I think the children do a very bad job handling their parents. It's, uh, I'm going to develop that theme this evening as to why the ordinary environment in the home it often uh, gets it's so bad. But just, and I would also think that the more we learn about the care of children, the less likely it is that parents can do the right things. And particularly where you have working mothers who want to turn children over to daycare centers, I think we're going to have to, in a sense, take the children away from the parents, not grab them away, but let the parents have the freedom they need by being able to turn children over to specialists. This is certainly going to be the case if anything like fem lib makes its way. I think women ought to uh, work if they want to work. And it's not, there's no more reason why they should be the ones to stay home and take care of the children than their husbands. That will mean uh, care centers of some kind. And 
I, but I don't believe this is the Sovietization of our youth or anything like that. I think it's possible to design fine centers where young people, can, young children, can get probably much more than they'll ever get in their in their homes. Uh, the, the Vice President Agnew disagrees with me on that, but uh, I, uh, anyone with, with whom he disagrees can't be all wrong. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Skinner, yeah. uh, when uh, you control the environment of uh, kids as they're growing up, don't you lose some of the flexibility in thought that uh, is of survival value to a society? Yes, that is a very common complaint, that somehow or other a design, a specifically designed culture would be regimentation, uniformity, lack of creativity, and so on. I dare say it would probably eliminate some of the conditions which have led to creative acts in the past. There's a great deal of our literature, art, music, and so on has derived from a great maladjustment to the, to the world, uh, to punitive conditions, uh, broken love affairs, and all of that kind of thing. Things we'd like, all like to get rid of, but we Perhaps he wouldn't like to get rid of the literature which has sprung from them. But it would be a very bad design indeed, which designed everyone alike. Anyone who understands evolution and the, and the whole point of an evolving culture, which would be a better culture than we've had in the past, will necessarily take diversity into account. The biologists do that. The biologists are worried right now because our agricultural practices are somehow or other eradicating all kinds of other varieties of plants which they like to go out and find to see if they can't use them to uh, produce better varieties. So you have to, have to preserve diversity. It would be a great mistake to do anything else. And it can be designed. I could think I could design an educational system that would make people much less alike than they are now. Because after all, the natural environment has, uh, over the centuries, produced a lot of people that are horribly alike. Thank you. Dr. Skinner, yeah. in uh, response to an earlier question, you indicated that nothing, I suppose in terms of behavior, but you said nothing really originates with man himself, but is rather a response to the environment and to the past history. Yeah. In your writings, you took a similar attitude with respect to natural language, and this, I suppose, resulted in some reaction which didn't agree with your philosophy. Would you care to comment on natural language and behaviorism? No, I'm not sure I got the last part. Would you care to comment on uh, natural behaviorism? On, on natural I don't, did you say natural behaviorism? Natural language. language. Nat oh, natural language. Right. Yeah. Are, are you talking about the, the Chomsky kind Correct. of... Correct. Uh, yes, all right. Um, um, Chomsky's uh, review of my verbal behavior, I haven't read his review of Beyond Freedom and Dignity. I tried to, I couldn't get past the first paragraph. But uh, <laughs> um, uh, he, he attacks learning theory on the grounds that it could not possibly account for the potentially infinite number of sentences that a speaker can compose, as if somehow or other uh, a potentially infinite product could not follow from mechanical systems of one kind or another. But that's just the point at which the parallel between operant conditioning and Darwinian natural selection emerges. Because if you have a kind of push-push, push-pull causality, yes, that would be the case. You couldn't produce novelty. You couldn't produce new things. You couldn't produce the works of Shakespeare just by stimulus and response. And I quite agree to that. But Darwin showed how by the mechanism of mutation and selection, living things seem to violate the, the rule against final causes. Somehow or other, consequences are effective, and they produce an infinite number of different kinds of living things. Someone has estimated that there are 10 million different species on the surface of the Earth, a very small fraction of which have, have, have been described. That, was, that is potentially infinite, I suppose, if time went on long enough and the world were big enough, infinitely big and infinitely long time. But the same thing holds in, in the production of novel behavior. The, if you 
expect somehow or other that the ingredients which are fed into the organism must be recombined, then it would be very hard to explain uh, complete novelty and diversity. But if you take the selection of what are essentially random mutations, various things that happen accidentally to you, and some of these then lead to d uh, effective behavior and some do not, then it's perfectly easy to explain the potentially infinite number of sentences which can be composed by, uh, by a speaker. Chomsky is, I am told by those who have read his review of Beyond Freedom and Dignity, is getting pretty desperate and uh, now insists that there can't be a thing like a science of behavior, that it's ridiculous, trivial, and so on. But I think that's a very dangerous strategy. That he's unaware of what is actually being done, and uh, I'm convinced myself that there, there is a substantial science and that it can account, as well as anything can account, for human behavior as we, we now observe it. Bear in mind that the, um, the cognitive or mental explanation of behavior is no explanation at all. It's no, you can't, by, by saying that people compose sentences by applying innate rules of grammar, that explains nothing until you've explained where the innate rules of grammar came from. And the only way to explain that is to appeal to the evolution of the species. And it seems very, very unlikely to me that people have been speaking long enough perhaps a thousand, two thousand generations, and that grammar could make that much difference to bring about the evolution of something called built-in rules of grammar. I don't think it matters very much whether you survive or perish, whether you're speaking grammatically or not, and um, it hasn't been going on long enough to make any great difference. Dr. Skinner, uh, in your thinking, there seems to be a dichotomy between, on the one hand, preservation of the culture, and on the other hand, preservation of the individual yes. uh, freedom. And when those two are in conflict, you would endorse the preservation of the culture such that the culture, or p pardon me, the individual comes to serve the culture rather than the culture serving the individual. How does one arrive at that value position? Well, I don't think that is quite right. Um, I don't, you see, I don't believe that there is any real freedom. I think we are entirely controlled by our genetic endowment and our personal histories. So there's going, not going to be any loss of freedom or any rejection of freedom. I'm not against freedom. Beyond freedom and dignity doesn't mean down with freedom and dignity by any means. It means there is something beyond. I want everyone to feel as free as possible. I think it would be wonderful to have a world in which everything you do, you feel like doing. And that is possible, but, you, but the why you feel like doing it is something which needs to be looked into. And uh, there are reasons why you feel like doing what you feel like doing. They're not conspicuous reasons. You don't resist them. You don't attack them. And it's very unwise at times because there are ways in which people can control you. Uh, and you will think that you are doing what you want to do. I've used the example of states which, uh, rather than raising taxes, set up lotteries. Now, this is very clever from the point of view of the politician. If you raise taxes, you may be thrown out of office as the next election. But if you set up lotteries and get the same amount of money away from the people, they'll say, that's fine, that's what I, that's what I like to do. I don't feel like gambling, so I don't. But let those who want to gamble, gamble. As if somehow or other you were free to gamble or not. But you're not, we know about that. There are certain schedules of reinforcement which will make a pathological gambler out of a pigeon just as much as out of a, of a person. And go, up to Las, go out to Las Vegas and you see this going on. There's the people, the, you know, they get their welfare check and take that free bus out to Las Vegas and stand there all night pulling this thing and something comes out, they put it back in and so on. In the morning they go back and wait for the next welfare check. Uh, this, is, this is not free. Uh, it's entirely the product of a particular schedule used to reinforce behavior by gambling enterprises. Now, the state that turns to that seems to be allowing people to do as they please rather than forcing them to pay taxes by the threat of police action and jail if you don't pay. But it is not doing any such thing. And, any, and anyone who makes the mistake of supposing that he is free to gamble or not to gamble, but not free to pay taxes or not to pay taxes, is just letting people get away with things. Dr. Skinner, yeah. I think you ignored a question from the audience. That is, whose moral code should we follow? You said you don't want to see control or control, or you'd rather see the leaders now change their ways to ma and make people better. You've yeah. used the word better. Yeah. 
Who's, what does that mean? Better yes, is that, important. Uh, um, I, I think there is an answer to that. I think it has to do with the strength of the culture. I think people are better if they are actually able to deal with the world around them more effectively and do so in, in ways which do not lead them to, to revolt. If you get people to behave with respect to the world around them through coercion, then you've got a real problem. They're going to, they're going to break it up sooner or later. But a world in which people develop themselves to the limit of their ability seems to me to be easily defended as the best thing for the individual and the best thing for the culture. I'm very much concerned with the whole problem of leisure in, in just these terms. People feel that when you don't have to do anything after Friday afternoon, or it's going to be Thursday afternoon before, soon, before long, uh, that you're then free to do as you please. Uh, we, we are very proud of the fact that we're getting down to the 30-hour week and so on. And if, if Adam Smith knew this, he'd say, oh, you've got it made. Now you've got the rest of the time to develop yourself, to become really a, a, your the fullest individual, com most complete individual which you're capable. That isn't what happens. What you do on the weekend is uh, turn to all of those things which leisure classes have always turned to. You get drunk or smoke grass, or you gamble, or go to the races, or you watch other people living dangerously on professional football, or there's the, Rome, the Roman circus in the old days, and so on. Um, these are, are things you can do all your life, and at the end you won't be any different from when you started. You haven't learned to do anything. You've not developed any of your capacities, anything of that kind. Uh, a, a, a culture which leaves what you do when you don't have to do anything to you, simply as an individual, is going to be weaker because you're going to do the easy things. You're going to just sit and watch the little tube, and um, you're not, not going to change as a result. I think you can defend uh, a culture which, for example, in, in its educational institutions builds up uh, interests in the kinds of things which, are de which develop the individual, teaches arts and crafts and participating sports, interest in, in, in writing and so on, and being an individual, cooperative social activities and all of that sort of thing. There are things that people can be interested in and do when they don't have to do anything. Uh, which develop them so that at the end of their lives they become as complete uh, individual as pos individuals as possible. And a, a culture that does that is going to be much better equipped to, to face the catastrophes as they, or as they arise or to develop and progress toward an even better type of culture. Dr. Skinner, I don't believe you've answered directly the previous question. Assuming no? that behaviorism um, can reach a situation where it has an adequate inventory of human behavior. How do you avoid the, the tyrannical implication of who decides which modes of behavior shall be reinforced or not? Yeah, well, you see, you're trying, you're trying to find a name. You'd like to have me give a proper name. Who's going to control? And that isn't it. The, um, the, it's, again, the mistake that people make by looking for some originator inside a skin, in a person. No person is going to initiate control. It isn't a question of what person will control, but under what conditions does the culture induce people to act when they have the power to control, and what does the culture induce them to do? It's the, it's the, it's the cultural pattern which lies back of the controller which is involved here. If you allow people with power to control simply for their own good, you'll get a bunch of despots and tyrants, as we have many, many times in the past. It isn't the individual or his compassion or his goodwill or his benevolence or anything of that kind that can be trusted. It's the world in which control is, is tolerated what kinds of control are tolerated and so on. A democracy was a step in that direction by emphasizing the counter control exerted by those who are controlled upon those who do the controlling. And that is, it is, a, is a move in the right direction. It's not enough, as I will indicate tonight. Four dollars, please. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Skinner. Yes. Okay. Dr. Skinner, yes. aren't your values also under environmental control? Am I myself? Yeah. Well, of course I am. And I, um, 
And I take it very seriously, and I, I, I make a great uh, effort to, uh, to create an environment in which I'm controlled more effectively than I am now. I, I believe in self-control, but I don't believe I do it by an exercise of willpower. I do it by building a world in which I behave effectively. I worked this out, I think, quite successfully when it comes to uh, my verbal behavior. I, I worked out an environment in which I write. And I really feel, that, except when I'm out wasting my time talking to you, that I that I that I am I get everything out of me that I have to say. I think I, I think I have worked out an environment in which, as a verbal organism, I really do. I don't mean I'm really wasting my time talking to you. I don't think that for a moment. But what I'm talking to you about is what I've already done in the past, and I want to get on to the future. You see that. That, that, uh, and uh, it's very tempting to, to go on doing what one has already done, especially when people show this much interest. But I, there, I have a future, I hope, and, uh, and I want to get to it. And, but, but I'm not doing now uh, what I would do if I were maximizing my total production during my lifetime. I'd, I'd just forget you and go back into that study with uh, the clock running and all of the things that I have r arranged, which permit me, I believe, to give out as much verbal behavior of quality that I am capable of, of, of giving. Dr. Skinner, um, you stated that diversification could be programmed, or an educational program could be set up so that diversification would be considered in it. But you've also stated that you believe the controllers should remain the people who are now in authority to control and that they should control better. Those people in this society and in others, not only this one, don't seem to be very much inter interested in diversification at this moment as, it, as a society stands now. What makes you think that they will devise or uh, in, uh, they would oh. want a program which would include yeah. such diversification? No, I think you misunderstood me. I don't mean that I particularly want the present teachers to go on teaching, but I want, I want there to be teachers. I think that there will be people who are in the position of teachers. They will not be directed from above in any totalitarian structure. They will be the kinds of people they now are, namely people who, whose responsibility is to transmit to new members of the culture what other people have already learned and to bring out special skills and so on in the individual. That, that I think, is going to, going to come about. But it, I, would have, I would hate to take the present set of teachers and, uh, and retrain them. That's a very difficult thing to do. All right, one more question. Uh, one more please. question, please. Right uh, there. Dr. Skinner, how do you feel about the uh, importance of heredity in uh, determining behavior as shown by the twin studies? The, the importance of heredity in determining behavior in general? Well, yes. I, I am not, uh, if you're getting into the, the, the Jensen uh, kind of thing, I'm completely uh, unequipped. I don't know the statistics of that kind of thing. I don't like the concept of intelligence. It's one of those things you put into the individual in, the, in an effort to explain behavior. I don't think very much human behavior is inherited. I, my, uh, when my two-year-old granddaughter bit me once, my wife was, in, uh, was just simply shocked, but uh, I had done something, and uh, she was just a little animal, and little animals bite when, uh, when they have been mistreated, and uh, I, I'm not surprised at that, but I don't think she's going to go on biting all her life for, for a moment. Uh, cultures are, exist to suppress whatever behavior we have ac acquired. What I've done today is not inherited. I didn't inherit the English language or anything of the sort. And uh, I, I, I believe that, that most of what we do is definitely to be attributed primarily to the environment. Now, whether there are differences in the extent to which we can be modified by, a, by our environment, that is a, a problem that I'm simply incompetent to judge. But I'm absolutely sure that every one of us could be, say, twice as effective as we are now, or let's make it 10 times, why not? Uh, better education, better forms of government, better incentive systems, we would all do very much better than we are doing. And as long as that possibility uh, opens itself up, I remain an environmentalist. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe you should go behind here so we can get away from the crowd. Uh,